Good morning, Casper. Good morning, Helge. Hi, how are you? Good. So, nice to meet you. Good uh, to meet you. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I discovered uh, Hagen Bikes uh, more or less uh, via the Instagram uh, movie of the guy who did the backflip with your uh, <laughs> small or your short bike. And then I was looking at your website, and then I said, "I uh, KP Cyclery." I I knew that for from in the past, but it, yeah, it I didn't make the connection in the beginning. So uh, it's nice. Um, I've read on your blog that you uh, yeah you're from uh, you're a native Estonia, so you live in Tallinn. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then you were always into bikes from from childhood on, and and a lot of uh, BMX stuff. I have seen. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, yeah. And then uh, you moved from Estonia or from Tallinn to to London in 2014. So yes, what, something was like that, this. Yeah. Was Maybe that for a, your yeah, studies something. or work or? It was for work. I uh, during my university I used to work for a company, uh, and then uh, one of the people who had worked there invited me to come to to London and work uh, work there. So. Uh, so yeah, I uh, yeah. took that uh, adventure on. Yeah. Okay. But it it had nothing to do with with bicycles or or uh, no. No. It was something completely different. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So and then you you thought about uh, the the your first project. So that already started more or less in when you lived in London, I think. Uh, the city bike. Yeah, so that started when I was in, in London. I, uh, by accident, I bought uh, a very cool bike from, from one guy who worked in, uh, in Google. And then, uh, yeah, once I had that bike, uh, I got curious. So who, who made this bike and so on? And then uh, I ran into, uh, ran into this one, one company in London who was building um, this kind of steel vintage looking bikes, but, uh, but with modern uh, components. Um, and then, uh, then I ran into another guy who did uh, the same thing in, in London as well. Um, but more, even a bit more custom than, than the first guy whose bike I had. And then, uh, then my, by now my wife, uh, then, uh, then we weren't married, but uh, she was studying in, in Denmark and then, uh, I wanted to go and follow her into Denmark and, uh, and figured, okay, like Denmark is definitely more of a bike uh, bike uh, country than uh, than uh, uk so uh, if if these guys are doing it in in london there there must be a way to do this in in denmark and then uh, then uh, yeah, i started figuring out the, the suppliers and uh, and designing the geometry and and doing all that and uh, and then yeah moved uh, moved to denmark and uh, and and started it there yeah yeah, yes, I saw that you you uh, started up a Kickstarter campaign for the launch of the city bike. So, I wondered, di did you uh, design the frame yourself, and did you also build the frames yourself in uh, in Denmark? Or I didn't build the frames myself. I uh, I designed the, the frames. So I took a lot of inspiration from the old uh, track bikes. The the Bianchis and Ginellis and, and all those bikes and also the looks were kind of like this very uh, traditional steel frame, track bike uh, frame. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the design w and uh, was inspired a lot by, by, by these and then like a mix of those Ginellis and Bianchis and, uh, and then, uh, but, but I didn't produce the frames myself back then. Yeah, yeah, okay. So and then after the city bike, then there was uh, the project with the bike hangers. So that was also more or less around the same time, or a bit later than I think. Then you then that then when you launched the the city bike. Yeah? yeah, it probably started like one one or two years after the bikes. Uh, when I was still in London, I made one for myself uh, because I was living in a in a small apartment and I, uh, I wanted to bring the bike inside so that uh, that it wouldn't be stolen overnight. And then 
uh, because the pipe was so nice, I wanted to put it up on the wall and uh, and have it displayed uh, in a cool way. And so I made uh, made one from old handlebars, and uh, uh, and then uh, when I was in Denmark, then uh, one Norwegian guy came to me once and was like, "Oh, do you, do you actually have something to to store a bike somehow indoors?" Uh, because he had um, a friend of his had uh, had passed away, and his uh, parents gave him the the bike, so he wanted to restore it and then put it up uh, up on a wall in a in a way that would be honorable for the bike. Mm-hmm. And then I showed him what I had done, and he was like, "Oh, that's exactly what I want." So I said, "Okay, um, I can make you one." And then uh, we made this one, and some other people. Who came to see the bike saw it and were like, "Oh, this is cool! I, I would mm-hmm. like that." And then, uh, then the bike hanger was really like the first success because the bikes weren't uh, weren't that successful. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, these bike hangers we sent all over the world, each each continent, not Antarctica, but but everywhere else <laughs> to Australia, yeah. Japan, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Korea, Brazil, Argentina. I think Chile, Canada, yeah. US, all over yeah. Europe, all uh, over Europe. Israel, yeah. South Africa, um, all these yeah. places. Yeah. Okay. So, and is it still is it still available, or did you stop the production of of the bike hangers? Yeah, we stopped stopped the production. Um, we just couldn't uh, couldn't really figure out how to present it well. That we thought we probably should keep the old brand alive just for that then because if we do cargo bikes then a wall bike hanger doesn't really fit into <laughs> it and uh, yeah. and uh, if we're not very yeah. yeah and if we're not very actively selling it then we probably the turnover would be the same as for two cargo bikes or something like this per year so uh, from from the business perspective it just didn't make too much sense to to keep having this completely different kind of a line of line of a product yeah yeah i understand and then yeah then then the, then the story with the cargo bike started did you already were thinking about it when you were in uh in odens or was it when you moved to to uh to copenhagen that was when uh, when i moved to copenhagen yeah um yeah, at one point I just uh, thought that uh, I would I would really like to have a two wheeled cargo bike. I, I used to ride the sidecar all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We didn't mention that. That's yeah. That's something that st- that was just before the the cargo bike. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Because in Denmark, at one point, I didn't know basically anybody who even had a car. So when I had to take the the bike frames into a paint shop uh, in, mm-hmm. a, in another city that was like 30 kilometers away or something, I had no other way to do it but than by by bike. So uh, uh, so yeah, from from childhood, we um, in in my little village um, there were some uh, some sidecars on on bikes that were like motor imitating the motocross uh, sidecars and then I thought but actually sidecar would be really good for uh, this kind of long packages uh, of, of frames so uh, so yeah I made, a, made a, a sidecar for myself that was the first thing that I welded myself uh, after after my university studies where we had some welding classes um, uh, yeah uh, and then in Copenhagen, I was riding it a lot as well, and I enjoyed it. Uh, but then uh, once uh, it became clear that that we would be moving back to Estonia, then uh, then I knew that we don't have much bike lanes here, and uh, the sidecar would just be too wide to to maneuver around here. Um, so I thought actually I, I would like a, a cargo bike, uh, a two wheel cargo bike. And I had also always always liked the bullet style, uh, the, the the sportier kind, and uh, and the the long john type cargo cargo bike mm-hmm. especially. Um, and so I I was thinking of buying a bullet for a long time. And then, uh, but since I had already welded quite a few sidecars and some other projects, we had done some trailers for for some companies and. 
and I, uh, I just became really curious about uh, trying to build one myself and just seeing if I can get the geometry and everything to work, how, how hard it is. And then, um, then, yeah, I started making one from an old bike. I cut up the, uh, an old, old steel frame and started welding onto it without any cheeks or anything. Just uh, kind of work, working my way around as I, as I went along and without uh, measuring any angles or anything, just kind of stepping two, two steps back and looking how this looks right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, uh, then uh, I, I got it made. Yeah, I, I started building it in, uh, in Copenhagen and um, I got somewhere like maybe 30% done with the frame and then we moved back and, uh, uh, and it was sitting in the shed for, uh, for a year or two years or something. And then, uh, uh, then I got uh, tired of using my road bike to go to work because my wrist started hurting by then. Uh, I was riding for two years uh, every day and, uh, and just with a backpack, there was so much pressure on the, on the hands that uh, they started hurting. So I figured out oh, uh, I need a cargo bike now. And then I took it out of the shed. It was so rusty and just cleaned off the rust and, uh, and, uh, started welding, welding onto it again. And, and then it took me a couple of months to, uh, to get it done. And, uh, and at first it wasn't actually really, uh, rideable uh -huh. because I hadn't paid attention to the front geometry and I didn't know what to pay attention to. Uh -huh. And, uh, the frame was not the wheels weren't exactly on the line one was like a little bit tilted to the side and then okay. also the front geometry the, the angles uh, were not uh, not correct so i didn't have enough trail for the steering stability mm -hmm. so i had to put on the, um, uh, a steering damper yeah otherwise it wouldn't just work so yeah. um but I, but I got it to work and then I used it for, uh, for about two years, but, and then people started asking more and more about it. And that's how we kind of made yeah. the leap. Then you started building, uh, yeah. The first production, uh, prototype then. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I'll have a look. Uh, okay. So it started with, with, um, with the Nighthawk, uh, cargo bike, which is now, I think the more or less the same as the, um, the flagship yeah. cargo bike you yeah. have now, you sell now. Yeah. And then there are also, then there's now also the, the, the extra large and the mini. So, uh, I think if I read it correctly, like the, the XL came more or less in an organic way because you, you needed a, a, a bigger or a, a larger bike for your own needs. So was that, the the in the incentive to to um, to create it or to develop it or was it were there other reasons? Yeah, firstly, it, it started with one customer from France asking it, and then we uh, asking for it was one meter by fifty centimeters cargo bed, and then um, we thought it it should probably work, and then uh, built one and saw that it actually handled really well. Mm -hmm. Uh, there wasn't much, too big of a difference difference with the with the flagship and uh, and uh, and this really big one, and then uh, then yeah, for my own needs as well. Um, so this was two years ago when when we made this first uh, first big one, and then uh, then we got curious of like actually maybe we should try and try and make it into, into a production model. And I, I wanted one that's bigger for myself as well, because, uh, we had a second child coming and I already felt like with, with the one child and with sometimes I would run out of space, uh, in the flagship, even with, uh, with a white box and, uh, one child, or it would just be enough. But then for two, two kids and having a lot of stuff, like all the weekly shopping or anything like that in as well, mm -hmm. then, uh, then I understood that it's already getting very cramped. So, uh, I wanted to, to, to make one, uh, that, that would be my bike. And then, uh, we could take all the pictures and everything and put it up on online and then see if people start buying it or not. We, we wouldn't be, yeah, uh, putting too much effort into, into making this and, uh, and yeah, being, being this kind of a very small company, then, uh, 
we don't have the the resources uh, to to just go out and make something and then uh, then uh, market it uh, so everybody in the world sees it or or something like this so um so yeah, kind of happened very organically, and then we took it to the to the next level with with my bike. We really thought the dim- dimensions out, so we made it wider than the than the first one was to to the customer in France, so that we could uh, sit uh, put in four seats for the kids as well. Um, but they had to be our uh, standard seats, so we didn't want to make uh, special seats for this bike. So. Um, and then from the freight company, we had kind of a, also a logical border where uh, where it would make sense to ship this bike and what the dimensions should be. So uh, so the width came from those two factors, and um, and yeah, uh, we thought it out. We planned it for uh, for a long time. We already wanted to have it about half a year earlier than than we finally had it done. So. Uh, it took a little bit longer, but uh, but I think the result is really really cool. Yeah, it's very, it's yeah, it's a, ni- a cool looking, nice nice long bike. It's uh, it looks yeah, at first it looks shorter than the flagship. Yeah, yeah, at first it looks too long, too big, <laughs> <laughs> a bit like a dragster car. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But then yeah. you get used to it uh, uh, quite uh, quite fast. So now when I hop on the on the flagship. Uh, I feel like this is the mini. You know, this uh, <laughs> it's just so small and uh, and agile compared to the XL. That uh, that uh, yeah, yeah. The XL okay. is the uh, norm for me now. Yeah, yeah. And then the the mini came after the uh, XL. Uh, the mini came before. We had um, yeah. So that was also a, a, a customer's request. Uh, uh, a shop that we will we were dealing with in uh, in uh, in Copenhagen. Uh, they uh, they said that they would like the mini bikes uh, because he had also had a bullet and then uh, he saw from uh, from the bullet world group that uh, a lot of people are cutting the bikes and uh, and welding them back back together and making them shorter. So he figured uh, that he would like to try to to sell the mini bikes. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, then we made a couple for for him, and, uh, and we always agreed that uh, that, uh, that we we could, we could be selling these ourselves as well. And uh, um, and he had sliding dropouts and some customizations as well on on the frame. So uh, so he had his special frames, and uh, and uh, we incorporated the same front end to to our bikes as well. Yeah. Okay. So your production is now in in uh, Tallinn in Estonia. Um, how many people work at uh, Hagen Bikes at the moment? So at the moment we have six people. Uh, we have uh, uh, an R and D engineer. We have uh, uh, some in marketing, and we have the mechanics and uh, and the welder as well. Yeah. Okay. So and how many bikes can you produce more or less in a year? Do you have an an idea of that? So this uh, this year we have done about uh, 150 bikes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, because you do also still a lot of customization of the bikes because I, I un- understood from Martin that you can have a lot of input if you uh, order a bike. So do you think you will be able to continue that when when production numbers will will grow? Yes, I think for for at least uh well, we will see how how fast things move, but uh, but uh, if we're still below like 500 bikes a year, then I think this is still still an advantage uh, because like there are things that that producing here we can never compete with. Like we can't can't compete with some Chinese prices or or like uh, yeah. Uh, Big bulk manufacturing in in Taiwan or something like this. So uh, so the production side will cost more for us. So uh, we have to make up for it uh, elsewhere. So if we if we produce uh, custom as well and we charge extra for it, uh, of course, then then that's something where we can make fit fit. A market, kind of a niche that nobody else is fitting because they ch- simply can't do it if they do it in in Asia. 
mm-hmm. and uh, and yeah, we f- we we fill that gap and then make make people happy in a, in a way that other other companies can't. So uh, um, so like right now as well um, in our studio corner for for taking pictures, we have this one bike with with four child seats and it's uh, we call it the X- XXL version. <laughs> okay. uh, it's. Uh, the same length as the XL, but it's uh, it's another 15 centimeters wider, so it's this big boat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you're still experimenting and thinking out uh, new models or or adaptions of the existing uh, models. Yeah. yeah. So that's what that's why we are so eager to do those customizations as well, because we learn about uh, about the bikes like nobody else can. So if if you have your sales department, for example, in, in Europe, and then uh, you have the production somewhere in Asia, then you simply don't say, if, if a customer comes to you and say, oh, I want a front suspension bike, you say, go elsewhere, <laughs> go buy a Riese Müller, you know, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. you don't say, hmm, we'll try we can that. probably do it, let's do it. Yeah, so uh, yeah. we have now done a couple of bikes with front suspension as well, for example, yeah. and, uh, and we would like to do... Uh, Try out a, a full suspension sometime as well, and uh, and so to 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 experiment with these things, because we you never know what what will work in the end as well, and uh, maybe if we make a full suspension full steel bike, we um, we we reach people that we otherwise wouldn't, or or there might be a group of people that might not be huge, but that might be buying. I don't know, 50 a year of these and uh, and it would uh, it would still be a, a really nice niche to fit uh, for for the right right pi- price yeah 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 that's i think it's an advantage of being not too big that you can still uh, adapt re- really quickly to the wishes of your customers or what's going on in the market or where's the yeah, the gaps still in 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 the market where other the like the big ones they yeah, they, they just start yeah keep on producing the things they have and it takes a long time before they bring out new models because yeah, it takes a lot of time. Yeah, if you're producing in Asia, you have you have to have either an engineer there that you communicate with or you have your engineer here who doesn't maybe 100% understand the production and then uh, it will be him communicating, him or her communicating with um, with the manufacturers in uh, in Asia, and then that already takes probably half a year to get anything on paper, and then uh, yeah. you maybe produce the sample. Even if you do it quickly, then you s- ship it here with uh, by by sea, for example. Then it takes another mm-hmm. two months, and then you try out the bike for half a year, and you're already one and a half years into the yeah. project uh, very yeah. fast. Yeah. Whilst we can draw it up in in a couple of weeks, get it done in a couple of weeks, try it out in a half a year, and then we we are a little bit more than half a year into the project when when we know that that the product works. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, how long does it take to to um, to to build a frame to to weld it? The welding of one frame takes roughly a day with a with a fork and everything. Yeah, okay. a bit less, but yeah, roughly. Yeah, yeah, okay. So and then I, I, yeah, what's what's really striking about the bike is like the the cargo area. It's it's made out of rectangular tubes, so it's not oval or or round tubes. So is there a special reason for that? Well, the very first reason was simply very practical that uh, that it just uh, felt like it would be quite easy to work with and and it was uh, easily available for the for the prototype. Uh, but then uh, uh, later on, when the first prototype was done, then it was also clear that it it leaves this visual impression that those sharp angles and this really clear cut straight lines they 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 give this certain impression about the bike that's uh, that's quite uh, unique and uh, and then if you think about any any cargo as well then all the the boxes that you put on the cargo bed whether it would be for a business or for having child seats in then uh, they still fit somehow on the frame so it makes sense to put them on a flat surface so uh, it also works from the practical 
point of view that uh, if you have something flat against the round tubing, then maybe in, in, in some ways it's, it's not as appealing. So if you have a flat surface, you want to put it on a flat surface and it just visually works, uh, works better as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so you sell complete bikes and you also sell the frame kits, I think. Mm -hmm. So for people who want to build it, it uh, up uh, themselves. So, but, and if you sell a complete bike um, and you ship it out from Estonia, it's, it's yeah, almost complete assembled, I think. Eh? So it's delivered to the customer, ready to ride. Yeah, not almost completely, but, uh, but yeah, completely assembled. So uh, this has also been something that we have been looking into that uh, if we ship from here then the shipping for us costs a lot uh, uh, on our website it's it's free shipping but uh, but it's not really free shipping we pay for it mm -hmm. so uh, we have been figuring ways to 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 save some there as well but in the end it just simply doesn't seem to make sense to 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 put any any assembly on the on the customer side uh, Especially nowadays, with uh, with the belts and so on, you need to have the the right right tension on the belt. So it would be really annoying if you get the bike and then you need to put on the wheels and you don't have the right tension on the belt, and then you go out and break the belt on your first ride, then you wouldn't yeah. be very happy. No, so uh, no. yeah. yeah, we want yeah. to ship ship out the bike fully assembled. So you just take it out of the packaging and and right away. Yeah, you're good to go. Yeah, okay. So and now you have also the um, like the e-bikes and you have the the mechanical bikes. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, is there? Yeah, if we see here in like in Belgium, if we see the difference in 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 sales between mechanical bikes and uh, e-bikes, even normal bikes, then the e-bikes are really, I think, taking more than than half of the turnover of the of the sh of the sales. So. How is it at, at, uh, with Hagen? So do you sell more e-bikes or do you sell more uh, mechanical cargo bikes? Uh, we sell roughly 50-50. I think now we sell a little bit more uh, e-bikes. Uh, a couple of months ago, a couple of months ago, uh, when we checked and it was almost exactly 50-50. Yeah, okay. So and you opted for the um, the Brose motor I saw, and in the beginning it was uh, the Shimano steps because Martin still has one with a, with a Shimano uh, mm -hmm. motor, and then you went for the for the Brose, um, and it was because of you wanted to integrate uh, like an anti theft uh, system I think. Eh? Yeah. Um, we wanted to have uh, an IoT inside, so uh, to to make the bike smarter as well, and to to get the full benefit of of what a modern cargo bike could be, uh, because people are always, of course, very worried about the cargo bike getting stolen, because that's not the bike when you live in London you take upstairs. Uh, it's a bike that that will be outside uh, for ninety nine percent of its life. So. Um, so we wanted to address this this issue as well, and uh, and there are all these IoT solutions available. But uh, but the Shimano uh, motors are typic very typical Japanese product where it's all closed and uh, nobody can gain any access to to any of the data or uh, or any coding or anything. Um, when we were working with one uh, journalist, that then he couldn't even get the motor mapping for the for the new cargo uh, cargo motor program. So. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so so yeah, we had to had to choose something else. We were quite happy with with the Shimano as well, uh, but then uh, we were basically left with uh, with either Bosch or or Brose for uh, for having a motor that's that's uh, more open uh, open and uh, and uh, would be available for this kind of an integration. Well, Bafang would be as well, but but we didn't want to have a Chinese motor. No. Um, and um, and then we did a lot of research online, looking at Bosch and, and Brose and, and also tried the different bikes with, with those motors. And we really liked the Brose because it's so uh, so quiet compared to, to the other ones. 
mm-hmm. and uh, and also it does have this very natural feel of of assist kicking in so you don't feel like it's just pulling you away mm-hmm. it feels especially on the lower levels as uh, as you're starting to doubt does it work even but then you see <laughs> like oh it's yeah. i'm doing 25 so it must be working <laughs> yeah 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 um so yeah that's why that's why we went for it for for its uh, its characteristics yeah okay okay so and you have also um the bikes are also available in uh, yeah you have two type uh, uh, type of frames i think you have the the with the top tube and then you have also one that's more slope so like with a step through uh, mm-hmm. frame so yeah. is, why did you decide on doing that we had more and more requests about the step through and then again we made one and uh, and for us uh, since we uh, uh, since the turnaround time for us is uh, the production time is is not very long for us then uh, we don't need to keep all of the options in stock so uh, for us it's a matter of keeping a little bit more tubing in stock to to weld the step through as well if if an order comes through so uh we saw that people are asking for it so so why not uh, satisfy that that kind of a need as yeah. well yeah okay so yeah because uh you you said it already you have like a, f- a very short you need a very short time to to produce a frame so do you also have like stock or do you really produce on on demand it depends on how fast the times are uh, sometimes we we produce uh, the, the the most common frames that we sell 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 the most often we produce into stock as well like the 50 53 centimeter uh, uh, flagship uh, electric and non-electric these are moving very fast all the time so so if we don't have we, if we're not fully booked with orders, then we produce these ahead of time, and then uh, and the rest we we do on demand mostly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you do the like um, the welding you do in your own shop. You told that already, and mm-hmm. and um, beca- and what what about the, the paint shop? Because you you offer the bike in any uh, RAL color, I think. Eh? Yeah. Uh, so do you also do the the paint job? Do you also have a a place in your workshop where you do the paint jobs, or is that something that you uh, give to another company? Yeah, that's what we give to another company. Yeah. Okay. So you stick to the RAL color. So it's it's not possible to do something really uh, different from 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 RAL then. Uh, we have done. We have also done wet paint with uh, a glow in the dark, for example, but that was a very special paint and uh, we had to source it uh, from outside of EU and then there was always the risk as well that we don't know how, the, how well the paint, uh, paint will, uh, uh, will, will handle the conditions of being always outdoors and uh, although it was advertised as as car paint and uh, in the end it started coming off very easy and uh, and the customer knew about this so he uh, he he was he, he sourced the paint himself yeah. but uh, but still it it, it wasn't uh, like looking back it's it's not as nice of a pro- project for because we uh, in the end we only found out when it was already in the paint that you can't cover it with clear coat for example and uh, okay. And then uh, the paint wasn't as strong. Uh, we have done some rel effect colors as well, for example, like some uh, some glittery colors and some some more special stuff as well. But that's always more on demand uh, and takes a lot of communication as well and asking if this is possible or that is possible. And there's these custom paints that you can get as well uh, mixed, uh, but uh, these take they usually have a quite a large. Uh, uh, minimum quantity so you could actually paint 40 40 frames so uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> so we can do this kind of things as well but but yeah. rally is definitely the easiest and the fastest and that's what we can promise so yeah and then uh, it still is yeah. yeah it's cheaper than all the special stuff so and because you you and you sell the the the, the frame kits uh, separately so 
Uh, it's always painted then in, in a raw color, or do you also uh, uh, offer the, the the frame kit like in, in raw condition, so like just not painted, or it's that, is that not possible? We have done it once or twice where we where we uh, had the frame not painted and then the customer painted it uh, themselves. But but for the steel bike, we don't. We have had had so many requests for just keeping the raw and just covering with clear coat. Mm -hmm. But we always uh, uh, suggest not to do it because the clear coat doesn't stick onto the. To the metal so so good as uh, as a primer does mm -hmm. i will always use primer and then uh, a coat and then the clear coat normally so three layers but if you only have the clear coat then uh, it starts chipping very easily so if you have uh, one small rock doing a little thing on the frame and then yeah. uh, the rust starts going under the clear coat so uh, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't look nice in in, no. in one or two or three years it, it will look good for a couple of months yeah, but yeah. once winter's winter hits, then uh, yeah. then it's yeah. not looking good anymore. Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Steel is is more. Uh, yeah, it, it rusts more easily than than the other. Like for example, an aluminum frame. Then yeah, yeah it's less a problem. Yeah. Okay. So um, I've also uh, seen on your website that you have a, a lot of uh, as accessories uh, for the bikes. So uh, it is the the main part of the accessories made for the the flagship, or can you also adapt some of the stuff for like the XL or the Mini, uh, for example, like the what you, like the, the side panels and uh, and the delivery box and stuff like that, or is it just is it aimed to the to the flagship? Most of it is aimed to the flagship. The side panels we have the versions for for all of those. And we will have a canopy for the XL as well, uh, but we definitely won't have a canopy for the Mini. Um, you can fit one small child into the Mini, but then mm -hmm. it's for for a couple of years only, yeah. and it gets gets too small. So, uh, so yeah, that that side is just too small to to justify making a, a canopy for that, and. Um, and yeah, the business box, it depends on, on the needs. So the business customers, they often order a, a bit of a larger fleet. So uh, if there is a need, then, then we can adapt. But, uh, but we won't, uh, won't do it before there is a, an order, basically. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so and do you, do you produce the, the accessories also in your own workshop? Or it's that uh, collaboration with with the other companies. I, I know, like the canopy. Martin told me that it's it's uh, it's produced by uh, Clares. In yeah. The, in Holland. So this is by this Dutch Dutch company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a version that we mm, developed ourselves, but but we weren't we we couldn't get everything out of it that we wanted. We really wanted to have a flexible uh, rear end. So that uh, if you have very small children, you can have this very sporty line where the, the canopy is pulled all the way down and it's just above the, the heads of the seats. Um, and then if the children are bigger, then uh, you can pull it up and maybe put on the, the up and down stem and, uh, and pull the handlebars higher as well later on. Um, and, and then also for the summer, you can just take the canopy off and pull the handlebars down again, for example. So we wanted to have this very flexible canopy that uh, you could adjust to the size, uh, so to always always have it as as sporty as you can, so not to have it coming all the way up over the over the handlebars and uh, and looking like uh, uh, I don't know I, can, I probably won't won't mention any competition names just <laughs> not to <laughs> no problem <laughs> not to yeah hurt uh, anyone's feelings okay well. I've, those who know the brands will know what you're talking about. No yeah. 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 Okay. So, in like the side panels and so, you do you that do you produce that in your own workshop or it's also something that you uh, do outside? Uh, yeah, th those are usually um, CNC. So uh, we don't have a CNC machine, so we uh, we outsource it from uh, a local company here as well. Yeah, but also in in uh, Estonia. Yeah. Yeah. Also here in Tallinn. Yeah. 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 Okay. 
Uh, same for the child seeds that we assemble them, but we have them uh, cut and, and done uh, by other companies. Yeah, okay. Uh, maybe we can... Oh yeah. Uh, we talked already earlier about um, the the IoT module and the GPS tracker. So, and then I saw on your website that you also offer um, your own app. So you developed an, uh, your own app uh, for your bikes to to see that you can you can follow them and you, ca you there's also some kind of uh, GPS function inside. I think. Eh? Yeah. So we have our own app. I don't know if it how well you can see on the screen here but here you can find your vehicle so it uh, shows you where the bike was uh, where and when it was last moved so mm -hmm. like half an hour ago my bike was uh, moved in in front of uh, front of our warehouse here or the production site uh -huh. so um, and you can track track all your activities here and um, and lock the bike from here so if it's locked and, and somebody's moving it then you get a push noti notification that someone has moved your bike uh, and and the alarm goes off on the bike as well so uh, yeah so if there's any thieves then that hopefully deters them a bit as well and even if they try to move away with the bike then the bike just keeps uh, sounding the alarm all the way ah uh, yeah okay Okay, so and like the 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 IoT module and and the app is that something you uh, offer uh, like a standard with every bike you sell or is it it's it's an option? Uh, that's a standard for all the e-bikes. So all all the e-bikes come with this. You sell d directly from your website and you send your bikes, I think, all over the world. Or maybe there are ex some exceptions because I know some smaller manufacturers, uh, for example, don't. Uh, sell their bikes in the in in the United States because it's it's because of laws and stuff that it's sometimes it's difficult. So, do you ship all over the world, or do you also have some restrictions? The biggest restriction is the price. If uh, <laughs> if people are willing to pay for the shipping, yeah. because all over the world we don't do free shipping. So uh, and the bike is so big that we have uh, shipped to US, for example, but the shipping is uh, like two thousand euros. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, you you have to take that into into account. But then the the VAT or the sales tax is a lot lower there, and uh, and the cargo bike prices still seem to be very high. Mm -hmm. They're a lot higher than in Europe, so um, so, so it's like still competitive uh, to to sell in the in the, yeah yeah. I, yeah. I didn't I, I didn't I don't know if you've seen, but there's a comment under the video I did with Martin from a guy from the U, uh, USA that he saw the video and he was interested to becoming an ambassador in the in the USA for Hagen. Ah, so I haven't seen that. Yeah, no. yeah go you have to go and yeah, I have to go and yeah. uh, contact yeah. that guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, so you you um, you sell over all over the world or mostly all over the world, and then but and and yeah, mainly in Europe. And I yeah, I had a look uh, at your website. So now at the moment, I think you have like uh, ambassadors or shops selling your bikes in um, almost around six countries. Um, so. Are there any plans on on developing like a, a real dealer network uh, in time, or do you really want to keep it it more from from your own uh, home base to sell to sell the bikes? I think we we haven't made uh, like a very strict decision there, so we are. Kind of adapting to the situation, how how things evolve. Um, so in it 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 looks like markets are a bit different as well. In some places, people are are, are more open to to buying directly, and then by by having a, a service a service partner. But in some places, people really seem to need this local shop that if something happens. I can go over there in in one hour or something that I don't need to wait for an for an answer or or to 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 book a time with a service partner or something. So uh, so yeah, some some places seem like they really need one very specific 
kind of service point or way of working. Yeah. Yeah, that I get my bike from there and I go there, I go back there if I, if I need. And uh, yeah, to have this human kind of contact. Yeah. But uh, but other places are are more open to buying it online and then having a service partner somewhere close and yeah. and then yeah. if there is a problem going there or or dealing directly. So yeah, because you offer like uh, some some kind of service contracts with a service partner, but it's not in in every country. I think it's it's yeah. just in a few eh? at, or yeah. at the moment. Yeah. 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 But the, the components are very standard. So uh, even in we haven't had many problems like really now, especially now with, with Brosa, like some shops have been saying, oh, I don't want to deal with Brosa. They have so many problems. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was uh, many years ago. Now, after switching from Shimano, then I'm actually a little bit surprised myself that we have uh, a lot less problems with the Brosa okay. uh, than, than we had with, uh, with Shimano, for example. But then... Uh, uh, for example, with, with, with one bike in a country where we didn't have any service partners, uh, there, was a, there was a problem that uh, somehow there wasn't any assist from, from the motor. And then we just shipped the complete unit to a local shop and, uh, and they, they swapped over the, the motor. So uh, any shop can, can deal with it and, and we can give them the instructions how to do it. And, uh, and in a way, it's... it's it's not even necessarily taking longer than it would with uh, with a Shimano service partner, as we have had uh, some Shimano bikes that needed motors changed, and then uh, it also took a long time for, even longer for people to to get a time with uh, with this service partner, yeah. And then the yeah. communication within the Shimano within the different departments as well took basically the same time as as for us sh just shipping the motor from here, getting it changed, and then we take the. The unit that that had problems uh, back, and then we troubleshoot it ourselves and and, and deal with all the communication. So, uh, mm. in a way, it's it's sometimes even easier. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, I think also it depends really from country to country. Here in Belgium, for example, we see that uh, with bike shops, they yeah they are all very busy and they can and they don't have really time to service bikes that are not so, uh, not sold by them so that's there's the the bottleneck so if people come mm -hmm. with a bike they bought on the internet or somewhere else they are not uh, yeah they they don't they don't take it because they say we don't have time we have to service uh, our our clients so that's a priority and and uh, and then maybe when we have some times we can have a look at your bike because, and even if it's a, it's a it's a components or brand that they sell uh, in the shop, so that's that's all. But but it, it, I think it depends from country to country. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes we also see that a lot of people can work on their own bikes. It, it's not like the the electronic part, but all the mechanical parts they can and they can do it sell themselves. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's yeah. still the nice thing about bikes is that they're not so complicated as as normal cars are. You don't. Uh, you're not that worried that. If I undo this screw and then all my warranty will be voided or, or something like this, that you can service your own bike and uh, and change some some basic parts yourself as well, or or even changing the motor, for example, which is also a mechanical job, just doing a couple of screws and then putting a new one in and plugging yeah. in the uh, the plugs. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. What will bring the future for Hagen bikes? Do you still have like? Uh plans for other models or for it maybe it's still top, top secret or uh, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, we have some uh, some uh, upgrades in mind and some things we want to test out so there's uh, and there's things uh, things a lot of people or people are asking about uh, on a regular basis that we want to try out and uh, and make and prototype so uh, so I think Definitely, we will uh, will keep uh, uh, imp improving the product in many ways. It's uh, it's in a good position already. Uh, I'm very happy about, about about my own own bike, for example. Uh, definitely now uh, with with the changes we've made when we switched over from uh, from Nighthawk to uh, to Hagen, 
uh, and making this uh, changing the rear end of the bike uh, for for the bigger tires and uh, still keeping it full size so not not the 26 inch but the 29 mm -hmm. so uh yeah i'm it it's so strange looking back now a couple of years ago or even one year ago where we were so uh so uh i'm sure that we will uh the same feeling will be also next year and the year after and the year after uh, when things progress all the time. Um, yeah, so there are some things that we are quite certain that, that, that we will do. And then I'm sure that there will be things that, uh, that come up like the full suspension bike. That's something that I would really like to, uh, prototype and, uh, uh and see. And then there's some, some marketing stuff that, uh, that we want to do that, uh, that has been cool doing like the backflip and uh, so doing this kind of uh, silly freestyle things that uh, that that we enjoy doing. That's uh, that's 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 fun. That's nobody nobody else seems to be doing really. <laughs> no. I'll see you. Thank you for your time, Casper. And uh, same here. We'll, we'll meet somewhere. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure yeah. the cargo bike yeah. world uh, okay. is uh, is not uh, <laughs> so big. So I'm sure we will keep bumping into each other. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It was nice meeting Same you. Same here. Same here. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>